Furthermore, the universe can be finite, and I actually believe the universe is finite. It can be finite and still not have a beginning. Einstein defined time as what you read on a clock. It's a number, the number of ticks on the clock. We count forward time, one, two, three, four, five ticks. We never reach uh, infinite, infinite time. We can also count time backward and never reach minus infinity. The notion that the universe had either a beginning or, had an, or will have an end are theological notions, not scientific ones. Now what about this fine-tuning argument? Again, it's an argument that is based on the low probability of our kind of life. And that means not only means carbon-based life, but also life uh, with the existing physical laws as, as we know them. Now, even if the probability of a particular form of life was highly improbable to occurred by natural processes, some kind of life would be could still be highly probable. Probably not silicon life. I agree silicon is, is a poor candidate, but that's with our existing laws of physics. Another form of life might still evolve in a universe with different physical laws or different physical constants. We simply don't have the knowledge to rule that out. To, to say that there's only one possible form of life and only one possible set of, of laws of physics and only one possible set of constants is extremely narrow thinking and not at all required by anything that we know about science. Now in this argument and other arguments about the um, design in the universe, uh, Dr. Craig claims that the universe and life are too improbable to be solely natural. However, this is a fallacious argument. To use probability to decide between two alternatives requires a comparison of the probabilities of each alternative. Dr. Craig claims these, these natural probabilities are exceedingly low. But he hasn't told us anything about what the supernatural probabilities are, and it's the comparison of these two that must be made. What's the probability that the laws of nature are violated? What's the probability that there's an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing, but undetectable super-being behind all of this? Complex things are common. We see natural events every moment. We've never seen a supernatural event. Furthermore, low-probability events happen every day. What's the probability that my distinguished opponent exists? You have to calculate the probability that a particular sperm united with a particular egg, then multiply that by the probability that his parents met, and then repeat that calculation for his grandparents and all his ancestors going back to the beginning of life on Earth. Now, even if you stop the calculation with Adam and Eve, you're going to get a fantastically small number to use the words that Dr. Craig has used before, improbability is multiplied by improbability by improbability until our minds are reeling in incomprehensible numbers. Well, Dr. Craig has a mind reeling, incomprehensibly low probability, a priori probability, for existing. Yet here he is before us today. <laughs> now, modern versions of the argument from design, both the fine-tuning argument and the intelligent design argument, share this fatal flaw. They are based on the idea that natural causes can be ruled out by some arbitrary notion of low probability. Now, Dr. Craig also asks, why is there something rather than nothing? Why does the universe exist rather than nothing? Well, why should nothing be a more natural state than something? Why would you expect nothing rather than something. In fact, how could nothing even exist? If it existed, wouldn't it be something? 
And finally, why is the God rather than nothing? Dr. Craig doesn't answer those questions. Now, Dr. Craig also claims that the Big Bang confirms the biblical view of creation. But what does Genesis actually say? It says that the earth was created before the sun, moon, and stars. This is at odds with modern cosmology, which says that the earth did not form until 7 billion years. Six thousand years old. Here's a picture of a quasar. The light from this quasar left 12 billion years ago, billions and billions of years before the Earth was even formed. Now every one of the thousand or so religions in the world has a creation myth. Uh, are more closely resembling to the modern cosmology than, than uh, Genesis. Now, Dr. Craig calls upon our common sense, our inner feelings, to attest that morality is objective and so must come from God. The same morals, so there's no evidence for objective morality. But even if morality were objective, its source could be natural, an evolutionary process that aids in human survival and is built into our genes. I don't see how Dr. Craig has disproved that possibility. Now, Dr. Craig claims that the gospel story is for this outside the Bible. The story of the empty tomb is second and third hand written years after the event from the oral testimony of supposed eyewitnesses. Paul did not even know about it, yet Paul regarded the resurrection as, as very important, yet he didn't know anything about the empty tomb. Furthermore, eyewitness testimony is, high, is notorious. natural explanation that Dr. Craig seems to think most scholars don't believe, but I don't see how they know that. If you were to go to Napoleon's tomb in Paris one morning and found that his remains were not in their usual place of honor, would you conclude that Napoleon had risen bodily? Somebody took the body. Dr. Craig cannot prove that Jesus' body could not have been removed by somebody. So that remains a more plausible natural explanation and a supernatural explanation is not required by the data. On personal experience, Dr. Craig says that uh, uh, our personal experience should tell us that God exists. However, that's subjective and not everyone shares that experience. So plausible natural explanations exist for all phenomena in the universe. God is not required to explain the universe and so Dr. Craig has not proved that God exists and I'll stop at that point. Thank you.